Um, it is not unusual when you mention, when you drop Elaine Pagel's name, for people to say, her book on fill in the blank changed my life. Or, I really actually believe that that is the best book I ever read. She and her work, she is a trusted friend of mine, but let's bracket that and talk about her work. Her work actually oxygenated my intellectual, spiritual, and religious life when I was suffocating. And so she is so important, period. And she's very important to me. And it's because of her scholarship that I feel so much stamina about doing the work that I'm doing here with you at St. Luke's. You will have that unfurled for you a little bit tonight, but in a major way tomorrow. She is the Harrington Spear Payne Professor of Religion at Princeton. She was awarded the Rockefeller, Guggenheim, and MacArthur Fellowships in three consecutive years. The author of the Gnostic Gospels, Beyond Belief, Revelations, How We Got Satan, I mean, all sorts of wonderful books, they're all for sale. And this amazing book, Why Religion, her personal story about her own great personal tragedy and how meaningful, healthy religion played a really important role. And then in 2016, President Obama gave her the National Humanities Medal. Just an amazingly accomplished human being. And when I talked with her on the phone this morning to make sure everything was right before she left Princeton, she was leaving her yoga practice, which is a daily group yoga practice. I love that about Elaine. If Elaine, Elaine never raises her voice to me. She always kind of whispers. You'll discover her as a very gentle person. And when we engaged her to come to St. Luke's in Atlanta, she kind of said in a whisper, she says, Ed, I don't know if you read my review on the front page of the New York Times book section this past Sunday. It was there. I hadn't even opened it yet. And I was talking with her on a Tuesday. I reviewed Mel Connor's new book, and I find it absolutely amazing. Could you invite him to speak along with me? Anything you say, Elaine, <laughs> it's yours. So we have this enrichment in our lives of Dr. Mel Connor, who is speaking tonight. Um, and he got special dispensation to be here from his wife. He's supposed to be in South Carolina at a wedding rehearsal dinner. And she said that he could speak at St. Luke's if he would get in the car tomorrow morning and make it on time to the wedding. So I think God is on my side. <laughs> he is the Samuel Candler Dobbs professor in the Department of Anthropology. Before he was a medical doctor, he was an anthropologist at Harvard, and Emory called him to ask him to come and start the first anthropology department here at Emory while he was in med school. He finished that med school and then came. And he is in the program in neuroscience and behavioral biology here at Emory, author of Women After All, Becoming a Doctor, The Tangled Wing, and this highly recommended book by Elaine Pagels called Believers. So, first, Elaine is going to tell you why she wanted him to be here as a kind of an introduction. He will make his major presentation about his work. Elaine will respond, and the three of us will have a conversation. So now, will you warmly welcome Elaine Pagels? That's yours. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here to see Ed Bacon and, and Rochelle and other very dear friends. And I just, I'll be very brief because I really want to hear from Mel Connor too. <clears throat> I was excited to read his book. It's called Believers. 
And because this book was addressing a question I'd been asking myself as a, as a historian of religion for decades, and that question is, why is religion still around in the 21st century? Because I was brought up in a scientific family, and my father had, had dropped it completely uh, when he encountered Darwin, and religion was totally obsolete, and he was sure that it was absolutely uh, going to die out by the end of the 20th century. Now, that didn't happen. But so many people who are scientifically inclined and scientifically accomplished have shared that view. And here's a scientist who had a, a very different perspective that I wanted to hear from, and I want you to, so I'll be really brief. One of the things he does is take on what he calls the quartet of belligerent atheists. <laughs> and you probably know who they are, Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, who basically say that, that, that religion is kind of idiotic, it's irrational. Um, Richard Dawkins, by the way, when he was an undergraduate, uh, was an evangelical Christian. And then he sort of flipped and became an atheist. Okay, this, this is a pattern for some people. Um, and, <laughs> and so, you know, the question is, um, and, and Mel Connor said, well, as you'll hear from him, I'm sure that, that he's not involved in religious practices of this kind now. Um, but he said, what strikes me is the persistence of religious belief he, and the conviction that it really is not dying out. I mean, you can talk about church attendance going down, but that's not the point. The point is religious traditions all over the world are actually thriving in many ways and changing in many ways. So it's that persistence of religious belief he was trying to understand. And um, so he talks about it in this book in ways that I was really longing to have a scientist do. The way that uh, psychologist William James in 1912 and 1914 wrote one of my favorite books, The Varieties of Religious Experience, trying to find a sort of a science of religion. How do you talk about it as a scientist, as a psychologist, um, in various ways? And James was taking on Sigmund Freud, who said this is a religion is an infantile neurosis uh, of the human spirit. Um, Dawkins likes to say that atheists, he calls, the, he calls them brights because they're smarter than you and me. No. <laughs> um, so this book uh, talks about questions. Why, why is religion still alive and thriving, changing, transforming uh, in, in lives all over the world? And every chapter of the book does what I always wanted to see someone do, takes up a different approach. Uh, one of them talks about brain mapping and where in the brain these sort of religious um, feelings seem to um, reside, if that's the case. Uh, another one takes up the, the question of the effects of various chemicals on the brain from, from uh, caffeine and alcohol, psychedelics, uh, a whole range of chemical alterations of the brain. Another one takes up cognitive psychology and another social psychology, anthropology, since he uh, has, has a practice as an anthropologist in Botswana. And every chapter, and then I love it, there are 40, I, I think it's 40 pages of footnotes, <laughs> so, that, so that when you want to f explore these various approaches, this is really a roadmap, this book, and I'm excited to be doing that um, as soon as I can. So I love this book. I'm going to stop with that. And um, I'm very excited to meet him tonight for the first time. And I guess one of the questions I'd like to, I'd like to ask you, although I don't want to alter your approach tonight, whatever that will be, which is how did you think of writing this book? I mean, I'm wondering what brought you to this topic in the way that it did. So with that, thank you. Looking forward to hearing you, Mel. Welcome, Mel. Thank you. thank you so much, Dr. Fagels. Uh, um, 
I don't know that I can say this is the best book that I ever read, because <coughs> there is Shakespeare and for Jane Austen and uh, Middlemarch, <coughs> but it's one of the best books I've ever read, and it has made a tremendous impression on me, which has led me to uh, to take a, di a different approach to tonight's talk than I would have <coughs> if I had not read it. You can see, I, I um, <laughs> after a certain age, I, I stopped making marks in books, thinking of future generations who might inherit my books. But I use these post-it notes to, to highlight the things that I like, and they were really a lot. Um, I'm very, very honored to be here. I'm honored that you braved the... Uh, the extra traffic from Washington, D.C. in order to, <laughs> to <laughs> come here tonight. And um, I'm going to do the, the very best I can to justify uh, Dr. Pagel's confidence in me. Um, so my talk is in, is in two parts. And the first is very personal, uh, and the second is uh, uh, based on slides, uh, which um, which relate to the arguments of my book, and I'll certainly talk about the the way I came came to the book. <coughs> yeah, we know we we don't need the slides yet. No. Um, tonight, I will speak more personally than I ever have in such a public setting, and I will do that because I am inspired by the courageous personal revelations of our guest. I hope you don't mind saying our guest. I have lived in Atlanta for 36 years, and I am proud to join you all at St. Luke's in welcoming Elaine Pagel to our city. If the city, if the, if the city had keys, I would give her a set made of gold. <laughs> Dr. Pagel's in her new book, Why Religion, A Personal Story, has woven together the exquisite strands of a lifetime of scholarship and the harsh threads of untold personal suffering. Except now she does tell it with quiet passion and serene ultimate acceptance. In delivering the gift of her life story, she inspires us neither to ignore our own suffering nor to embrace it as a life's work, but rather to take it in, feel it, live through it, and come out on the other side, not whole, never that, but healed enough so that the scars are reminders and not open wounds. From sources of terrible weakness and grief, she finds the creative, intellectual, and spiritual power to uplift every person that reads or hears her words. I'm not going to preempt her chance to tell her story as you visit with her over these hours and days, nor am I going to claim that my suffering has been like hers because reading about her has made me feel, among other things, lucky. But we all have suffering to endure. <coughs> and I'm going to tell you about some of mine, knowing that in due course you will hear about hers. I only hope I can find words as uplifting as hers were for me and why religion and I believe you too will find them to be as you read and hear her remarkable voice. I will also try in the course of these reflections to meet the challenge posed by Reverend Bacon in his title for our conversations, This I Now Know, In This I Now Hope. It will not be an explicit point-by-point -point credo, <coughs> and yet I think by the end you will have seen key elements of what I know as expressed in my book, Believers, and what I hope harder to define, but at least equally important. If I were not here tonight, I would be at Friday night dinner with my grandchildren, blessing the candles, wine, <coughs> and bread, and above all, blessing them. In Hebrew, I use the words that archaeologists tell us were inscribed on a silver amulet dating back 2,850 years. Since they are part of Christian tradition, too, you will recognize the translation. <coughs> May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May God's face lift toward you and give you peace. <coughs> For various reasons, though, I long ago decided that I would not recite the exact translation. So when my children were young, 
my wife and I would put our hands on their heads and I would say in Hebrew, <coughs> I would say the Hebrew, and then I would say, may you have lives of health and happiness and peace. At some point, being the hopeless egghead that I am, I added an intelligence and peace. <laughs> then when our youngest daughter became a choreographer and dancer, <coughs> by then their mom had passed away, it became an intelligence and art and peace. When my oldest daughter's husband joined us, I added sports. And when their son, at age five, had <coughs> become obsessed with animals, they, along with nature and conservation, joined the litany. <laughs> and finally, so far, not so long ago, his kid sister asked, what about love? And after slapping my head in amazement at my omission, I now say, with all the grown-ups' hands on the two children's heads, May you have lives of health and happiness and intelligence and art and sports and animals and nature and conservation and here I pause to meet the candlelight twinkle in my four-year-old granddaughter's eyes, acknowledging our delicious conspiracy and love and peace. And we say amen, the Hebrew for amen. Marjorie, their grandmother, was nominally Jewish, but shared none of my orthodox upbringing. Nevertheless, she loved the Friday night dinners because our strict rule was that all three kids had to keep their seats around the table for an hour anyway, just one night a week. <coughs> His Holiness the Dalai Lama, ever curious about how the Jews have survived two millennia of the diaspora, was told by a leading rabbi that if he had to pick one reason, it would be Friday night dinners. His Holiness reports being puzzled. Why should a ritual have so much power? I would answer because it is in the home. With respect, I suggest that a celibate monk, and I have great respect for His Holiness, but uh, a celibate monk living among celibate monks may have missed the relationship between faith and family and how they nurture each other. For my part, growing up, I could hardly distinguish them, and I remained steeped in both until age 17. Then I drifted off, an ambitious and self-absorbed academic, and substituted anthropology, science, evolution, left-wing politics, and the certitudes of the 60s for the faith of my mothers and fathers. Those were the crucible of Marjorie's and my romantic and marital bond. Our African adventure, combining research with cultural collision, sealed the deal, and my apprenticeship in the trance dance religion of the hunter-gatherer people who welcomed us was a roundabout way of reconnecting with faith. As my grandmother might have said, this is not Yiddish, this is not Jewish. <laughs> yet, yet it affirmed what would be my lasting respect for other people's faith. But when our first child came, a daughter, I looked in her infant eyes and said to myself, self, is this 3,000-year-old tradition going to end with you? Mm. I lit the Hanukkah candles for the first time in over a decade. Marjorie was a good sport about raising the children Jewish, although not orthodox. Gender equality was too important to both of us. Nevertheless, the Friday nights and holidays, always involving the home, helped us weave a spell of respect for tradition that kept the children close and supplied a certain formal fabric for our busy family life. That fabric, though, that life was to be torn by forces neither faith nor family nor science could control. I returned from a conference to find Marjorie wondering about a lump in her left breast. <coughs> I felt it, and I did not need to have gone to medical school <coughs> to have been concerned. It was not round, smooth, soft, or easily movable. <coughs> I thought, she's too young. She's breastfeeding her third child. It's too improbable, aside from the fact that I absolutely did not want to believe it. Still, it had to be looked at. <coughs> I called our friend who did mammograms every day, and he saw her immediately. Her parents were visiting, and they went to his office with her while I met a class. As she described it, our friend emerged holding the dark film, his face white as a sheet. She was diagnosed with a stage one tumor. After more testing, it was decided that with a mastectomy, radiation, and chemotherapy, 
she would have an 85% chance of five-year relapse-free survival. Susanna was nine, Adam was six, Sarah was 15 months old, the baby was weaned overnight, the breast that was removed was just full of milk. She bore all of it bravely, lovingly holding together the threads of motherhood and weaving them as well as she could. She did not tell the children about the most ominous possibilities and demanded the same secrecy from me. She became anxious, especially after what she called the umbrella of chemotherapy was folded down. She sought and received exceptional support from friends. Her diet and self-care had always been impeccable and cancer only enhanced that. In a checkup during the fourth year, a metastasis was found in her liver. This, doctors know, is, a ter is terminal in breast cancer, but Marjorie did not acknowledge it as such. <clears throat> we never discussed it. She fired physicians and friends who urged her to prepare for the worst. Even some of her parents' questions led her to largely dismiss them. She sought alternative therapies and forms of meditation, ritual, and faith from sources and cultures too numerous to mention. <clears throat> she also, so to speak, kept the faith with modern medicine. And until she became extremely frail and weak, she devoted all she could to mothering. She said countless times that she had to survive for the sake of the children. A few weeks earlier, I had felt compelled to go against her wishes to the extent of telling the children. <clears throat> they were now 17, 14, and 9. They were angry at me for a long time for not telling them sooner and for asking one of our rabbis, a warm and spiritually gifted young man whom they knew, to be present when I told them. There is nothing at a time like this that is easy to decide or understand. On her last night, she was brought unconscious to the emergency room. I, the kids, and our nanny, a round, warm, amazingly loving Atlanta native who helped save us, were in the family room, and I visited Marjorie's bedside without, I believe, her awareness. <clears throat> At around 5 a.m., a 30-something physician in wire-rimmed glasses took me aside to say, her heart has stopped twice and we have revived her, but now we think it is futile. I would like your permission to not put her through this again. I looked in his eyes and said, I am her husband. She told me she wanted everything done. I can't be the one to tell you to stop. He returned my gaze and went away. Sometime later, he came back and said, I'm sorry, sir. Her heart stopped again. And this time, we were unable to revive her. I don't, excuse me. I don't know his name, but I will always be grateful to him. It was not a happy time. I had not been a perfect husband, <coughs> but I had always been there, and I was certainly there for the children. I suffered from depressions, and this was a long and hard one. I used to joke that the kids were my personal three-man suicide prevention squad. <laughs> one night, a few weeks after his mother's death, our son came into our bed. He was taking a biology course in high school, and he asked me if I thought there was a soul separate from the brain and its electrical activity. I said it was a complex question, and I tried to leave room for both questioning and hope. I had spoken probably too long when he said matter-of-factly, I think it's just the brain, and went back to his own room. In time, the kids were all right, and they still are. <clears throat> I know that's what their mother would have wanted more than anything. I recovered, and some years later found love again. <clears throat> My wife, Anne, and I were married in 2005 with two of Atlanta's most marvelous clergy, Reverend Joanna Adams and Rabbi Alvin Sugarman, <laughs> blessing our union privately and publicly. <clears throat> we just celebrated our 15th anniversary, and their blessings on our union have been realized. My children and I celebrated Christmas for the first time with Anne and her teenage daughter, Logan. <coughs> and Anne supported our ongoing Jewish holidays and practices. Our nest emptied, and not to nearby places, 
But my oldest, who is here tonight, <coughs> moved back to Atlanta and had both her children here. As I had been for my three children, I was present by invitation and from a corner of the delivery room where Ethan, <laughs> Ethan and Hannah's births Susanna deftly combines motherhood and law practice, and the Friday night dinners are precious. Her mother would be very proud of her and of our other children as well. When Marjorie was so ill and succumbed in the end to her illness, I can't say that I was heroic enough to truly wish that it were me. But I did think, it could have been me. Why wasn't it me? And I have been asking that ever since. I felt as if I were living on borrowed time, and I have felt that ever since, trying to live every day. I also used to think at least it wasn't one of the children. And then one day last summer it was, or was the equivalent for me, when my grandson Ethan at age seven was diagnosed with a lymphoma. Now I did wish it were me. I used all my resources to make sure the treatment recommended at Emory, which I knew would be harsh, was right. Two top experts at Harvard, one at Yale, one in Israel, all of them, incidentally, women, said, the people at Emory are great, and if you brought him here, we would do the same thing. His mother, my daughter, the lawyer, asked, are you going to keep calling people <laughs> until <laughs> someone gives you the answer you want? Uh, she was right, and I stopped. We accepted the inevitable, anything needed to save this boy. She and his father were astoundingly resilient, and so was he. But it was harsh. I'll just tell you about one day. His father and I were in the room with him while he got chemotherapy, one of the most toxic agents in his sleep. Suddenly, he sat bolt upright, crying and yelling, covered with a rash, and scratching himself all over. I sat down on the bed with him. He stared around at and through me with wide eyes, screaming, I can't see anything. I can't see anything. Hoping that it was just some sort of night terror, I, his dad and I helped him back to sleep. But it wasn't a night terror. It was a mistake. The drug vancomycin had been infused over two minutes instead of two hours. <laughs> he had an extreme version of a known reaction, but the next time he woke up, it was just a horrible memory. The nurse who made the mistake came in with her supervisor, explaining and apologizing. I hugged the nurse. We were lucky. Susanna reminds me frequently how, how lucky we are compared to some other children on that ward. They have longer, harsher treatments at younger ages with no understanding of what is going on. Some get worse instead of better. Most parents have no medical knowledge or connections, only hope and faith. The nursing on that ward is almost uniformly superb, and the treatments are preventing countless deaths that would have been routine 30 years ago. So in that sense, all of us are lucky. A dear friend of mine, a lovely woman disfigured by her cancer surgery, has two things to say. Cancer treatment is barbaric, and it saved my life. Mm. If I can distinguish here between what I know and what I hope, I know we are doing better than we used to, I know we are not doing nearly well enough, and I hope we do better soon. There is a Jewish mystical concept called tikkun olam, usually rendered as repair the world. But the mystical part is this. God, the rabbis say, deliberately left creation unfinished, inviting us, us in as collaborators to do the rest of the work. I have tried to do this in a small way through my children, my grandchildren, my students, my friends, my research, and my writing. I know, I know that is my legacy, and I hope it will make the world a slightly better place. At the risk of preempting Dr. Pagel's words, which I know you will find both illuminating and healing, I want to end this part, first part of my talk, with the same Jewish prayer of thankfulness with which she ends her painful, wonderful book. Blessed are you, O God, 
Tehekayanu, who has kept us in life, Vikiamanu, and sustained us, Vihigiyanu, Lazman Hazer, and brought us to this time. As the partisans fighting, fighting the Nazis ended their famous Yiddish song, Mir Zenendo, we are here, and we are thankful to be here. So, if we can go to the second part of my talk, that is uh, my grandchildren at the sea's edge walking into a future that I won't see. Uh, that is Ethan after his first, um, really first initiation into chemotherapy. Let's see if I can click this on. What did the triangle say to this circle? Heh. I just think you're pointless. <laughs> right. So this, just, just after he started chemotherapy, he's covering his head because he had his, his, a buzz cut that he, he, it took off all, all of his hair that he was <laughs> proud of. But that, that, and then he went on uh, to lose all of it. That is a, a, a picture uh, uh, taken on the last, by, by Susanna and Baum on the last day of, of uh, his hosp last hospitalization. And, uh, and that Band-Aid is where his last IV was. Um, this December 15th photo uh, shows my, my latest grandchild, my stepdaughter and her wife uh, had a baby on December 15th and he was there with his two moms. And there he, <laughs> there he is uh, <laughs> recently. Uh, this is a Friday night dinner um, in January w with uh, Ethan and Hannah um, exercising what they, uh, I suppose, think of as Sabbath peace <coughs> with a bubble generating machine. Uh, this is Ethan on his way into the, the CT scans that were follow up done uh, two weeks My ago. My scans are clear. <laughs> Okay, I'm, okay. I'm also grateful for this is last Friday night. screens. I know everybody, I know that every kid's grateful for it. Every kid's grateful for screens. I am to my life. Screens. Uh, Madison. That's a friend. Chemo. So his sister is Chemo saying, saved me from cancer. You're grateful for chemo? Cancer, cancer was destroying all my white blood cells in my body, and if all the white blood cells were destroyed, I'd be dead. Dead. But I'm not. I'll never have anything like it. So he, he is old enough to conceptualize what he went through which was really terrible. Uh, and, uh, and he was really resilient and, and, and you can hear in his voice that he's really happy that, that it worked. So this is a, a, a sticky note that I put on my computer desktop um, when I first started thinking about uh, writing Believers. And I, I thought, well, most things that are written about religion are about one aspect of religion. And really, there are so many different things that are, are included in the concept of religion and faith uh, in so many different cultures. And I didn't want to, I wanted them in front of me all the time so that I wouldn't ignore any of them or forget any of them. Um, <clears throat> I had had uh, the experience of, of teaching monks and nuns the nuns are, of course, way off in the corner back there in the, this very patriarchal society. But uh, this was in Don Sala uh, with the Emory Tibet Science Initiative. And, uh, and after uh, our about of two weeks of teaching there, uh, we went on a tour of northern India uh, and learned something about, uh, about Hinduism uh, firsthand. Um, 
I, I am uh, totally fascinated by all the religions of the world. Um, and uh, this from, from this past summer, just before Ethan got his diagnosis, we were in India for a month. And this is, uh, we happened to be there on the holiest day of the Buddhist, at this monastery, the holiest day of the Buddhist year, and you see uh, um, <coughs> monks lined up and chanting uh, on Sakadawa. And the, these are, are young boys who are, who are, who are monks uh, at a very early age, uh, lighting, lighting candles. This was a visit to a, a Hindu temple in Mongad, a small town in, in uh, um, southern India. <coughs> and uh, usually you're not supposed to go into a, a, a Hindu temple if you're not Hindu, but our a Buddhist monk friend <laughs> got us into the Hindu temple. <laughs> and there, there are these two uh, little boys uh, in the temple and a man praying. Um, this is a, a beautiful mosque in, in the same t little town of, of Mungad and a, and a mosque uh, on a seashore in Kerala. And um, this is a, a, uh, a Santa Cruz Cathedral in, uh, 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 which is in which there was a worship service uh, uh, on Saturday afternoon for, for uh, early Sunday mass, basically. And, and uh, we visited a convent school. Kerala is, is by far the most Christian state in India. And, uh, and Christianity is, the, uh, is probably the dominant religion there. And there are many beautiful churches there. Uh, and here um, we have a synagogue that has uh, uh, become basically a synagogue without a con congregation. It's more or less a museum in, in a place where Jews were in India and Cochin for, for more than a thousand years. Uh, and, um, and there are active synagogues in India. Uh, for example, this one in Mumbai. Uh, the Jewish community of India was, was tolerated very well uh, for all that time. So. This is uh, a representation of, of Noah's sacrifice after the flood, and God says, I will not curse the ground anymore for man's sake, uh, <clears throat> because the imagination of the heart of man is evil from his youth. Lev Adam Ra Minu Ra. And um, you can see there, you know, this is, this is what, the, these are the texts that I, cut my eye teeth on, that's me as a bar mitzvah boy, age 13, <laughs> and, and, and you can see the evil that I, I, I had in my youth. So uh, as I was losing my faith at, at age 17, in fact, two days before my 17th birthday, I went to Washington, uh, Boston in the middle of the night against my parents' wishes and got to hear the I Have a Dream speech, uh, one of the uh, great moments of my life and great memories. You can see me right over there. <laughs> uh, uh, but it, I would just say that it, while the values of, of, of um, left-wing politics and the 60s culture were, were becoming more dominant in my mind than traditional Judaism, uh, it was not lost on me that, that uh, Dr. King was using the language of the Jewish Bible that I grew up on to... to promote the cause of, of liberation for, uh, uh, for African Americans. Um, in my graduate program, I, I had to do field work, and I included uh, um, two years among the Bushmen or San of Africa. And the, and if we could get, no, oh, I guess that light has to be on me. So, so these are men who are in, in a profound trance uh, in which they, they believe their souls leave their bodies. They go to the village of the spirits and they, they negotiate on behalf of sick people to, uh, to kind of uh, get the, 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 the bad spirits off the backs of the living. And um, they do not have a reverential attitude toward God. And they, they, they have a, uh, an antagonistic one. And there, there is a, um, a Jewish tradition of arguing with God, but it, it's much stronger for, for these people. Uh, they pretty much just 
expect bad things from the gods and, and argue with them um, on a regular basis. So when I went back in 2005, because my, my wonderful daughter Susanna uh, uh, was taking a trip to Africa and said, why don't you come? Uh, the trans dance ha had, had shifted so that women were doing it more, more than men, and that was a very interesting change. And, and of course, fire, uh, very important, uh, central, uh, of central importance in human evolution, of central importance in the evolution of conversations and language and extending the day into the night, and also uh, ex um, in, in developing the idea of sacred. I can't think of a religion where, where lighting candles or some form of fire isn't important. <coughs> um, so we have, as Dr. Pagel said, uh, certain opinions about what religion is, and uh, and those uh, have been extended in modern times. But Darwin, unlike these two gentlemen, uh, Marx and Freud, Darwin thought religion was very complex, consisting of love, submission to an exalted and mysterious superior, a strong sense of dependence, etc., and perhaps other elements. But more importantly, and this is in a letter to an American friend who, who, was, a, who was a clergyman. Um, he had very interesting correspondence during, uh, with, with Asa Gray during the Civil War. Uh, and he was an abolitionist and, and, um, and very much a proponent of the end of slavery. Um, I he said, I feel most strongly that the whole subject is too profound for the human intellect. A dog might as well speculate on the mind of Newton. Uh, <coughs> so then we move forward a few decades to what I call Russell's rule and uh, abstracted from his various writings. Uh, uh, this philosopher basically said, it's better not to believe in things for which there is no evidence. And that is the, uh, um, the first article of faith of, uh, of what, uh, what I do, as Dr. Pagel said, I refer to as the quartet. Some people refer to them as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> but um, it, it, it is, you will notice, a, a statement of value. It is not a scientific statement. It's not a statement of fact. It says, it is better not to believe in things <coughs> for which there is no evidence. So there's no way to prove that that's better. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a statement and an, op an opinion. So uh, <coughs> Dr. Pagels wanted to know where this book came from, and, and I tell you the, the, the initial impulse came from a conference I went to called Beyond Belief, and it's a, it was in 2006 in the Salk Institute. It was shortly after the death of Francis, Francis Crick, one of the, the um, people who, who uh, uh, worked out the structure of DNA. And, uh, and his uh, uh, spirit sort of, he was very anti-religion, and, and, and he, he helped conduct a, um, an essay contest in England uh, at one point in his career, uh, which the, they wanted to get the best essay on what shall we do with the chapels. And, uh, and, the, and the prize-winning essay said that we should turn the chapels into swimming, swimming pools. To give you an idea of what <laughs> Francis Crick thought about religion, uh, and but but this conference uh, had some very distinguished people. And Steve Weinberg, the Nobel laureate in theoretical physics, gave a key, the keynote address, and he said the world needs to wake up from its long nightmare of religious belief. And he went on to say, this may be the import, most important thing science contributes to humanity, getting rid of religion. This was, a, this was a, a mission that they stated as the purpose of this conference, and it was, and it was the beginning of a movement. Uh, and, um, and I'm thinking, uh, penicillin? Uh, <laughs> international communications technology? Uh, holding the, the whole world in the palm of my hand and my, uh, and my smartphone? I, but the most important thing that science contributes to humanity, uh, according to Steve Weinberg, uh, is going to be eliminating religion. 
And at this conference, <coughs> one of the members of the quartet was very prominent, uh, Richard Dawkins, author of The God Delusion. If this book, book works as I intend, religious readers who open it will be atheists when they put it down. <laughs> All right. So uh, speaking about uh, de what a delusion is, if you look up the definition of delusion in the psychiatric manual, uh, you might think that it includes this statement. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this one, too. The End of Faith is the title of Sam Harris's first book. The second one was called Letter to a Christian Nation. It was not favorable to Christianity. And uh, he says the days of our religious identities are clearly numbered. Dan <coughs> Dennett, a uh, very distinguished philosopher, um, was not present at, at the meeting. He, he, he was a, but he was a presence there. He sent a, an essay. The reason he wasn't there was that he had a, a massive uh, aortic dissection two weeks before the meeting, which he survived. It's just one of the, the most life-threatening things that can happen to you, basically the wall uh, of your aorta, the largest artery in your body comes apart, and the layers come apart from each other. Uh, but he sent an essay that I thought, I thought was a good essay. I'll tell you about it later. But, but I, for one, am not in awe of your faith. I am appalled by your arrogance, by your unreasonable certainty that you have all the answers. This is one, one of the many statements that these people make that shows how little they understand about faith and people of faith. Uh, they do not understand the first thing about faith, even though the phrase leap of faith should be in their face all the time. And they should know that people of faith are always struggling with their faith. And they're the, one, the, the ones who are arrogant uh, uh, and sure of themselves are in the minority. And of course, Christopher Hitchens, not a scientist, but, but I think a great essayist, says philosophy begins where religion ends, just as chemistry begins where alchemy runs out and astronomy takes the place of astrology. Being, being a non-scientist and a non-philosopher, he had mostly rhetoric uh, to offer against religion. <laughs> but, but it was very clever rhetoric, and, and, um, and he died of cancer um, uh, without knuckling under. You know, W.C. Fields, the famous atheistic comedian of the 1930s and 40s, said, I'll die without knuckling under. I don't know whether he did, but Christopher Hitchens clearly did. Uh, and um, Rabbi David Wolpe, who is a distinguished Los Angeles uh, conservative rabbi, uh, had a series of deb debates with him uh, as he was dying and, and speaks very highly of, of uh, Christopher Hitchens despite their diametrically opposed views. So what are the arguments against belief? There's no evidence to support religious claims. Science has closed the gaps. What is called the soul is just brain activity. Religion has evolved just like any other trait. Religion causes violence, hatred, and war. This is very important and religion is the opium of the people. God is the product of yearnings for a perfect parent, reward and punishment, companionship, meaning, life after death, and religion more generally is the product of human yearnings for identity, belonging, a sense of superiority, blameworthy enemies, and narrative. Furthermore, all sacred texts contain errors, lies, contradictions, highly implausible histories, silly and cruel behavior of gods and religious heroes. However, None of these objections is in the least way new. All have been heard or thought of by most intelligent people. None has posed a serious obstacle to belief for the majority of believers. And it's a, one, one of the things about the kind of, of aggressive atheists is that they really think that people of faith have not thought about these criticisms of religion before. Uh, and uh, uh, that's another evidence, uh, piece of evidence of their ignorance. Uh, no, seriously, ser seriously, they don't know. They don't know anything about faith and people of faith. And furthermore, um, as I said at, in my talk at that conference, which was supposed to be about the evolution of ethics, but ended up being about <laughs> about why I didn't agree with these guys who had dominated the conference. Uh, they. they uh, if you wanted to do a scientific uh, approach to, re 
to religion, and you, you know, open up your, your electronic document and you make two columns. You want to find out whether religion is on the whole bad or good, and on the one side you put uh, bad things done by religion, like, like <clears throat> uh, attacks on, on people who, who, who cross themselves with three fingers instead of two. And, uh, and on the other side you put good things done by religion. But these guys only have one column. And that's not a scientific approach to finding out whether religion is on the whole good or bad. So how can it be that people of faith know all about these things uh, and, and continue to believe? And don't, don't read Richard Dawkins' book and then change their minds and say, oh, I guess I forgot. Nah, you know, uh, some religion, religious people have done bad things. <laughs> now I know that, and I'm going to stop being religious. I, and the answer is, of course, that faith is something special in human experience. The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That is the other opinion that's different from Russell's, that it's okay to believe in something for which there is no evidence. Uh, and, um, and it's a very important difference. Sam Harris says, religious faith forms a kind of perverse cultural singularity, a vanishing point beyond which Rational discourse proves impossible. Yes, that's what it does, Sam. <laughs> get over it. <laughs> All right. They can't get over it. <clears throat> Here's Dawkins in an earlier book that I happened to review for Scientific American. He says, I remember once trying gently to amuse a six-year-old child at Christmas time by reckoning up with her how long it would take Father Christmas to go down all the chimneys in the world. The obvious possibility that her parents had been telling false, falsehoods never seemed to cross her mind. So, uh, <laughs> and he, he did not see in talking this six-year-old out of believing in Santa Claus. But uh, maybe if she was eight or nine uh, and still believed in Santa Claus, she might have had better luck. But there, there is a... Uh, something called coexistence reasoning. It's a study by a psychologist named Christine McGarren at the University of Texas, Austin. And she has studied in different cultures around the world and children of different ages and in adults. And here's what it is. Coexistence reasoning is you are a perfectly rational person. You live your whole life in a, in a, in a rational way. But there's another part of your mind that, that doesn't use the same tests of rationality and logic. And, and with that part of your mind, you, you believe in something that, that does not necessarily uh, uh, subject itself to, to rational proof and, and, and testing. Um, my wife, who is a, a Presbyterian, uh, uh, scientific psychologist, a hugely uh, um, um, adept at statistics and, and uh, experimental design. And when, you, when I asked her um, how her faith works, she just says, I do it with a different part of my mind. That's coexistent reasoning, and that, um, that explains a lot. <laughs> so I might answer that religion is natural to think because it's built into the brain at least many brains, influenced by genes, develops in childhood and evolves through natural selection. So those are the, the things that I, that as Dr. Cagle said, I, I, I argue in my book uh, are, are, are the explanations for why, why I don't think uh, 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 that religion can be abolished, which is the goal of the, of the quartet and the, uh, uh, and the aggressive atheist. Uh, and I also take up the question of whether abolishing re religion would be a good thing. I mean, suppose, suppose it weren't instantiated in human nature like I think it is. And suppose you could wave a magic wand like, with like this clicker and make religion disappear from the world. Would that be a good thing or not? So these guys think absolutely it would be a good thing. It would just cure everybody of, of their, their illusion, their unscientific illusions, and it would put an end to violence. And, uh, in, my, in my presentation at that <laughs> meeting, I'd mentioned uh, the Nazis, who, which was not a religious movement, and Stalin, who was not, you know, 
leading a religious movement than Mao, who was not leading a religious movement. And it, so you, you know, you don't have to have religion to 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 do mass murders. <laughs> it turns out, uh, and and or any kind of murder, but. Um, it's an open empirical question, and, and Daniel Dennett, come, the philosopher, comes closest to, to uh, understanding this. It's an open empirical question w whether religion on the whole does more good in the world or more bad. And uh, my reading of the evidence is that it does more good, uh, a lot more good. And, uh, uh, but, but, um, but it is an empirical question. Uh, the question, uh, can, it, can, can, relig can their goal of abolishing religion be realized, uh, uh, to me, is, is answered. That's some, uh, something I feel uh, I know. It cannot be abolished because it's part of human nature. <coughs> so <coughs> Elaine mentioned uh, William James uh, and a variety of religious experience. He, he's, he, he's a medical man. He's talking about medical materialism and said geniuses in the religious line have often shown symptoms of nervous instability, led a discordant inner life, and had a melancholy, had melancholy during a part of their career. They've been liable to obsessions and voices, seen visions, presented all sorts of peculiarities, which are ordinarily classed as pathological. So, no, the, this, is, this is something that somebody like, Har like Harris or Dawkins would look at and say, Okay, so give it up. I mean, this is what it really is. It's just mental pathology, brain pathology. William James is a trained physician and the founder of scientific psychology. And he says all this, and then he says, so what? Uh, and uh, he thought that faith could be explained by brain science and psychology, but not explained away. <coughs> and that's what I think, too. <coughs> um, so one of the things, I can only tell you a, a tad about, about the brain investigations of religion. This guy, Michael Persinger, thought he had discovered the, the, the God spot, and that's the God helmet on the right there, uh, <laughs> stimulating the God spot. If you put your, your fingers between your ears and your temples, you'll be pointing at the temporal lobes, which are uh, where the God spot is supposed to be. And... Um, he, he used uh, uh, almost superstitiously weak magnetic stimulation to, to get the effects that he claimed to get. Um, yeah. uh, but there's Dawkins on a BBC program uh, uh, undergoing a little experiment, really more of a stunt than an experiment. <laughs> And uh, he said, well, he, he felt a sort of twitchiness and that he was very disappointed. And, and for years afterwards, he kept repeating about how disappointed he was that he couldn't get a spiritual experience. This guy, uh, Ramachandran, a, a wonderful neuroscientist, uh, neurologist, was on the same program, and he said, so what? He says, because there are circuits in your brain that predispose you to religious belief does not in any way negate the value of religious belief. And uh, many religious people who understand brain science have said, so God put this spot in your brain, uh, or this circuit in your brain that would enable you to, f to find faith, to feel faith. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's, that it's not a, a real subjective experience. So, uh, and then and on that same show, uh, Dawkins said, oh, yeah, this is really heartfelt, the human religious impulse does seem very difficult to wipe out, <laughs> which causes me a certain amount of grief. Clearly, religion has extreme tenacity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, why does it have extreme tenacity? Recent studies suggest Religious experience involves specific brain circuits. Trance and meditation involve profound changes in brain activity. Serotonin, a brain transmitter, a brain chemical, is involved in both psychedelic and religious experience. There is no God spot, but there is a God map, which means there are circuits that are apparently um, um, partly dedicated to religious experience. A famous study of Carmelite nuns um, the instruction was to go in the MRI scanner 
<coughs> and um, and think about or try and remember the most profound experience of God that of your relationship with God that you've had since you joined the convent, uh, and then with random variation and order, go into the scanner and, and think about the most important uh, experience you've had with a person during, your, during the same time period. And, um, and the nuns didn't say, are you kidding me? They actually just participated in the experiment <laughs> and, and there was a difference between the circuits engaged and the, those two conditions. So the claim that that your relationship that their relationship with God is just uh, uh, another uh, relationship with a with a person is not true. There there's evidence that um, from from study by Sam Harris, which he did after he wrote the End of Faith, uh, that um, um, when people are in their scanner thinking about um, th the statement. Uh, <coughs> Eagles really exist. Different uh, brain circuits are activated than when they're thinking angels really exist. And so on with prayer and meditation and all kinds of different uh, um, um, aspects of faith that, uh, that have been studied. And I won't get into the weeds, but I'll just go to switch to the, uh, <coughs> the uh, other way of looking at the brain, which is uh, the chemical way. So mind-altering agents are used in many religions. There's peyote, a fly agaric, uh, uh, alcohol uh, in, in, in uh, ancient Greece and Egypt and, and even Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, uh, cannabis in Hindu tradition and, and uh, uh, nicotine in American Indian uh, uh, religious practice, all kinds of plants. Plants that have mind-altering substances in them have been used to uh, to to enhance religious experience, and and um, so here here's a lovely uh, part of a lovely hymn that that the Huichol uh, Indians of, of the Sierra Madre in Mexico um, sing when they go on their 300-mile round trip to to collect peyote uh, uh, annually. We we came on this trek to find our life. We are all, we are all, we are all the children of a brilliantly colored flower, a flaming flower, and there is no one, there is no one who regrets what we are. So this is incorporated into their deepest uh, religious experience. And um, the other thing I want to tell you about that is that all, all the, uh, the plant substances that, ha that are in the category of psychedelics stimulate the brain's uh, serotonin neurons. And that's a, a depiction of the serotonin neuron. And when you look at religious people compared to non-religious people, um, there are also differences in that same serotonin system that without, without psychedelic agents op operating. So that's another way of gaining insight into how the brain does this. It is also true that religion is substantially heritable. Its heritability increases from adolescence to adulthood. I don't want to ex explain that, but that's an important concept. Uh, people think that, that the older you get, the farther you should get from your genes, but it doesn't work that way uh, in most traits. Uh, and uh, specific genes are under study. So back to the, uh, the flame uh, and... Uh, and the Dennett essay, which is called Thank Goodness. So Dennett had this horrible aortic dissection, and he wrote this essay, which was read aloud at the conference and much discussed. And um, basically it said, a guy came to me in the hospital and said he was praying for me, and I said, uh, yeah, but uh, I wanted to say, yeah, but did you also sacrifice a goat? <laughs> and he, and somebody else came to him and said, don't you thank God after surviving this horrible thing? And he said, no, I don't thank God. I thank goodness. I thank the goodness of the doctor who, I, who, who picked up on this horrible uh, uh, process that was going on in my body. 
I, th I thank the goodness of the surgeons who devoted their lives to learning the skill to repair this thing. I thank their the nurses who helped them. I thank the orderlies. I thank the phlebotomist who took my blood without hurting me too much. I thank, and he went all the way down to the people in the laundry. So I thought it was a very, very good essay, and he's a good writer. And I, and I came home from the conference, I, and I said, and I, to my wife, my wife was in bed, I said, uh, you know, take, take a look at this. It'll take you five minutes to read. And she, uh, she read it, and she threw it across the room. And I said, you know, I said, what was that? I mean, she's a Charleston-bred lady. <laughs> <And> <laughs> I never saw her do anything like that before. And she said, doesn't he realize that all those people believe in God? <laughs> so that became the, the inspiration for a chapter of, of my book, that is to find out whether, uh, whether there are studies that show that, that, that belief influences altruistic behavior. 70% of American doctors believe in, in a higher power. Uh, and uh, um, and more nurses. I mean, you go down to the people in the laundry <coughs> in the hospital. <laughs> you, I could you, you could bet that there's going to be a higher and higher percentage. What makes these people get up every morning? What makes these people go and do things that are so hard? What makes them uh, uh, make sacrifices every day for for uh, uh, other people's welfare? Uh, it's not that there's no such thing as an atheist who does those things. There is. But the question is, on the whole, do you really want to abolish religion before we understand how important it is in motivating people to do, uh, uh, to do good things? So uh, within every uh, major faith, more religious people have more children. That, that's just a, a fact of, of demography. Uh, and it's part of why I know that religion is not going away. And uh, <laughs> this is my old friend, late Robert Hamilton Kelly, Methodist uh, theologian and preacher at Stanford. And I asked him uh, a few, couple of years before his death wh whether he was worried about uh, uh, about the quartet and other aggressive scientific attacks and philosophical attacks on religion that were that seemed to be growing, and uh, he said God can handle it. And, uh, <laughs> and I think um, that's one way of expressing the idea that people of faith can handle it, and and, uh, and, and are going to. Steve Gould, the uh, uh, famous evolutionary biologist, wrote, wrote a book in which he proposed this, this acronym NOMA, non-overlapping magisteria, uh, to, to say that religion and, and uh, science should not bother each other. Uh, and uh, I, cha I changed the meaning of NOMA to neither one is magisterial. <laughs> and each one is a candle in the dark. And if you realize how much darkness there is in the world, you know, you, you would think it was crazy that somebody wanted to blow out one of the candles. Uh, Brecht, in Life of Galileo, has Galileo say, the aim of science is not to open the door to infinite wisdom, but to set some limit on infinite error. So when you do that, uh, there's an awful lot of unknown. And uh, in the space left outside of science's limits, in the inner spaces of the human heart, which suffers in ways science does not address, there is room for and need for hope. And none other than Charles Darwin, who is admired by every one of the, the people who attack religion so relentlessly, Darwin was not one of them. Darwin said, let each man, let each of us hope and believe what we can. Thank you. And uh, sorry I went on so long. Um. Let's come sit down over here. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm going to bring your mic. Okay. Yeah. Good. Mel, would you like something to drink? We didn't want one. Yeah, just right here is great. Okay. In the lane, if you'll be there. I'll get it. Oh, this will be for you. You can put it there if you don't, if you want. So my idea was that 
there would be a conversation between the two of you, and then we would open it up to everybody, and then we would go home and get some good sleep and come back and learn some more tomorrow morning. So. Good. Well, thank you very much. I'm, thank you for wonderful. listening. <laughs> and you know what struck me particularly um, is that the images you presented were images of temples and rituals, Indian temples, Buddhist temples, synagogues, churches. Um, you're talking about practices. That is, prayers, rituals, songs, chants, um, what, birth rituals, adolescent rituals, marriages, burials, mm -hmm. all of those things. And, and then when you're talking about belief and, and you know, the quartet, um, they're not talking about practices. Mm. They're not talking about experiences. Mm. Um, they're talking about belief in six impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> you know, right. um, Alice in Wonderland, whatever. Um, you know, the question of do you believe in God? I mean, it becomes a question of believing in, uh, in abstractions or believing in um, phenomena which you can't prove. And I just think there's been an overdose of belief in the way people talk about religion because there's so much influenced by Christianity. And Christianity is just one part of a very wide spectrum. And, and before the fourth century, it wasn't just a bunch of beliefs. It was called the way. It was a, it was a way of life. It was shared values particularly is about ways of treating people. And, and it was a, a ways of celebrating, it was ways of having a community uh, with shared values that were mostly about how, how to create a society which is deeply respectful and humane. Um, and, and I just think we lose a lot of that when, when people focus only on belief. And I was thinking of Steven Weinberg you showed. <laughs> yeah, I remember at the beginning of his book, The First Three Minutes, Steven Weinberg says, he's the one who won a Nobel Prize in theoretical physics, now at the University of Texas. He was at Princeton before. He says, the more we know about the universe, the more we know it is pointless and meaningless. <laughs> well, you know, he pontificated. It has nothing to do with physics at all. I mean, it, you know, there's, there's a total non sequitur, like so many of the other statements that these people make. So I guess, like you, I, I'm most interested in this, the questions of religious experience, because, and I'll stop here, uh, William James wrote this book, you know, describing such a wide range of religious experience. And in that book, he disguised his own experience. You know that, I'm sure, right? Mm -hmm. He wrote the book because he had fallen into a crippling depression. And he, he was unable to think, how, how do people get through the day knowing what we know about death? And he says he came out of it um, by, by holding on to, to phrases like, the Lord is my shepherd, or things he'd heard in childhood. Think, he said sort of like a drowning man grabbing at logs in the water, right? And he said he didn't believe in them particularly, but he held on to them and, and somehow he got out <laughs> of, the, of, of the depression. So I think that is such an important point you make and about, and, and the, the images you showed are so much about practice. And I was also very much interested in your experience in Botswana and, you know, how religious practice is enormously powerful. So th that's just a comment that I wanted to well, that, that, that's, say. That's great. Um, I, I um, let's start, start with the last thing first. The, the, um, the Bushman uh, religion, um, which, which certainly what I would call it, um, 
it, it was be actually belittled in a review of my book um, uh, in the Wall Street Journal uh, by, by a Wall Street senior editor at the Wall Street Journal who said, you know, this guy thinks that that's a religion. And, you know, in so many words. And, and of course I think it's a religion. I, I don't know, how can you not see this much passion and belief and, 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 and the conviction of things unseen and, and, and also the, the exercise of, of the practices, which you properly called attention to. If I were to say um, the, the, uh, what the ratio is of practice to, uh, to, to belief, uh, or, uh, in, in that culture, it would be extremely high compared to many other, uh, many Western cultures or more uh, advanced cultures. Um, furthermore, when you study the beliefs of people in a culture like that, there's no dogma because there's nothing written and nobody can enforce a particular set of, of, uh, of beliefs or challenge you if you, uh, if you depart. So you, you, you can, and even these, these different people who go, who leave their bodies and go to the world of the spirits come back with, with different descriptions. There's a ballpark, you know, as a population of, of gods and spirits. There's a, uh, an idea of the village of the spirits and, and the road to the village of the spirits. But, but when it comes down to specific beliefs, it's, it's not nearly as important as, as the practice of of dancing in a certain way until you go into a trance and then putting your hands on people and then going through this, this energetic process of, of, of trembling and eventually shrieking and taking the illness out of somebody. That's the thing that's very formalized and very, uh, uh, very predictable. Um, not, the, not anything in, in terms of specific beliefs or, or dogma. And when you spoke about your family's practice, and the Sabbath ritual with the children. I mean, I think that's very moving. And obviously a very powerful kind of experience for them to have and remember about the family. Uh, so that is that struck me as in a similar way. Not as sim same as the Bushmen, but, yeah, and, and but, a, but a practical um, connection. I mean, I don't know how to put it, but it's a ritual. It's a, it is a ritual, and and um, and I, th I thought it was very interesting the, the the Dalai Lama's description of his his puzzlement. It's in one of one of his books that I read. The, his puzzlement that a, a ritual that ritual should matter so much, uh, in, because he's inter he's interested in how people survive a diaspora because his people are in a diaspora, and he, you know, that that's one of the reasons he interest he's interested in the Jews. Uh, um, it's not, it is a ritual, but it, 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 it's in the home, it's in the family. It's, it's, uh, it's a thread of, of religiosity and, that, and practice that goes through the home and the family. Uh, I'm sure that Christians have uh, um, Sunday dinners that, that have many of the same characteristics. Um, but you could not, uh, you could not sustain uh, a religion without it being uh, interwoven with families and, and with certain things that you do at, at home. And, and uh, you know, it's deliberately showed all, uh, all those different religions whose institutions we visited, uh, uh, whose architecture we saw in, in India this summer, um, I made a point of showing children because that passing, passing the tradition on to children is, is not incidental, it's not peripheral to the uh, enterprise of, of faith and, and, and religion. And the children come into the, into the world with an openness to, to faith and, and, uh, and hope. And you don't, you don't want to take that away from them. You certainly uh, uh, want to give them an opportunity. So why did, did my, my, my late wife and I decide to give our children exposure to, uh, uh, to Jewish religious upbringing? Because we thought if you don't have it, 
then, I mean, if you do have it, you can always grow up and say, I don't want that anymore. If you don't have it, where's your choice? Uh, and, and so we gave them the opportunity to, to choose. I, I simply want to emphasize the experience that you're bringing up. I, like Elaine, was very, very moved as you were talking about the Friday night blessings of your children and your grandchildren. I was also moved by, um, and I think this is going to tie into some of the points that you're going to make tomorrow, Elaine, about the early Christian movement was really a rather open process rather than a closed down doctrinal dogmatic mm -hmm. in versus out beliefs, but rather it was about this kind of open-ended mystical contemplative experience with the emphasis on the word experience, which you made me weep when you were talking about how you would add something to the traditional blessing, including nature and conservancy, and finally, love. It was just very moving, and I think that that is actually one of the reasons so many people look to your scholarship, Elaine, as a delivery system for oxygen to their closed down churchianity of saying you have to believe this rather than focusing on the experience. Yeah, I think many people um, deny themselves, I was going to say, um, the experience of, of worship, prayer, singing, uh, all of that because just because they're being honest. I don't I don't accept the creed, you know. That, that they say, do I believe that? Not really. And so they think that's what it would mean. You have to believe that. You have to mean every word of it. Um, there's a, I go to a church in Princeton with a priest who said in a sermon that he would rather say the 23rd Psalm than the Creed. And somebody at the Presbyterian Seminary across the street reported him to the bishop for heresy. <laughs> oh, my. Well, we laugh, <laughs> <wonderful>. too. <laughs> But some yeah. people don't, right. and that's unfortunate. It is. <laughs> but maybe we should just open it up. Yeah, I think well, so. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm going to ask just, for I, 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 uh, you know, I go to synagogue a few times a year, and I go to church with my wife a few times a year. Um, the, the, uh, I'm, uh, I fast on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and, um, you know, I go in the evening at, at the end of the day, and, and I'm told that, and we're all told that the gates of heaven are closing and this is our last chance for repentance before the gates are, are closed. And I'm looking at these hundreds of people around me and I'm wondering how, how many of them literally believe that? How many of them literally believe it's their last chance for, for repentance? And yet, and I, and I don't know how many, I'm sure some do, but probably not most, when I'm in... The, the, the service I find most moving at uh, my go to my wife belongs to First Presbyterian Church and and uh, the Easter service is, is is very moving to me because of the the theme of of hope and uh, it's about it's about hope uh, and, and it's about um, triumphing over the fear of of death that we all have to live with in our, in our lives. And, uh, I'm looking at this, you know, 2,000 people around me and thinking, how many of these people literally believe that Jesus rose from from the tomb after being dead for three days? And uh, and I'm thinking, it doesn't really matter how many of them <laughs> do. It it matters that they share in the in the power and meaning of the story and the and the hope that they get from from the shared experience. Uh, so that that's like what uh, you were saying, Elaine, about about the um, not necessarily <laughs> believing in dogma uh, in order to have a, a religious experience. And our, our our being here during the season of Lent is actually an experience. It is a journey, and we are going toward Easter. And it's not so much that Lent is about kind of getting your dogmas right but rather getting your experiences rich. And that's, what, that's why people, this many people, have come <laughs> through all that traffic 
<laughs> to, on a Friday night after a busy week to fill this room, to engage you all. So let's take time. Uh, Elizabeth has a mic. Let's take a couple of questions. And uh, if your heart is beating fast, that means the Holy Spirit wants you to ask a question. <laughs> there you go, Judith. And you knew I would have a question. I did. Um, which I can't remember how to ever do the mic. Um, I just want to express my astonishment, which I've had for a long time, that scientists, scientists should be the ones who are most aware of how totally ignorant we are and how scientists could talk about being able to assert a belief in anything about either the existence or the non-existence of God. And like one of, to me, one of the beauties of religion is it celebrates our ignorance, our brokenness, how it lets us be totally honest about how limited we are, which should be one of the first things that scientists are aware of because the scientific method is about doubt and about making, just developing evidence about theories. And I just wanted to Thanks. hear response? your response to that. Right, well, so uh, Einstein, who was not always kind to religion and faith, uh, um, did say, uh, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. And that's exactly, I think, what, what you were saying, that there, there is a, uh, and, and in fact, Dawkins wrote a bio, an autobiography called uh, uh, The Sense of Wonder or something to that effect. And The Sense of Wonder is what I, I think uh, where, where everything worthwhile begins. Um, the trouble is that that these scientists uh, uh, try to close close down uh, the, the the thought processes of of other people, which go in a different direction from from theirs. And in that sense, there um, to me, they have a lot in common with with religious fundamentalists who can't tolerate. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm other people's religions, the way uh, um, millions were killed over, the, over, over Martin Luther's statements about Catholicism, the way uh, yeah. millions have been killed uh, over the differences between Shia and, and Sunni uh, beliefs. Uh, this, these are, are uh, the opposite of the searches that I think we should, we should be on, whether in science or art or, or, or mm -hmm. religion. Elaine, did you, did you want to respond? Well, you know, I, the more I've been, I've been thinking about it, uh, I'm very struck by um, the way that, well, in your book you're talking about people who think that the whole brain is about rationality mm. or the mind is about, ra or our experience is about that. I mean, when I, th when I was writing about the book of Revelation, it's not my favorite book, but, <laughs> but it's been very <laughs> powerful in the culture and very powerful also for artists and musicians and mm -hmm. filmmakers mm -hmm. and um, poets. I mean, it's, it's got an amazing cultural afterlife. Mm -hmm. But also, it's been very effective in war. And, and, and that's why I was writing about it at the time, because it was used by George Bush uh, when he was going into Iraq um, to promote the war. And, and what the point of saying that is that what I see so much of the power of religion is about emotion. Mm. It's about dealing with our emotional life. It's not about rational thought, primarily. At least it isn't for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One more question? Melita, please. Since both of you are fans of each other, <laughs> how, how would you each best summarize what you admire and appreciate most about the work of your colleague? Mm. Work of, of your colleagues, uh, of, of, of one another. 
Well, I, I really I think love Elaine the questions you raise. Said it. <laughs> I love the questions you raise and and the openness to those questions. I mean, um, in the book, and then you know many questions, many approaches, and then the fact that you, like Darwin, say there's no single answer. This phenomenon of religion is not just a matter of emotional comfort or social bonding, or you know, easing the fear of death. I mean, there are many things you can adduce as reasons for that the phenomenon of religion is, is important in human culture. Mm -hmm. But you don't take a single answer because there isn't one. I mean, there are probably many, and I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm, how much time do you have? <laughs> I, uh, I, oh, I, I have a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, being being at a, uh, at a small conference uh, that Dr. Cagle spoke at and I spoke at the, uh, in the 1980s about rage, power, and aggression, and and um, I just and I'm like still vivid in my imagination how eloquent she was. I always have admired her eloquence and on the page and in, and in speech. Uh, but also her 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 honesty and uh, and openness in in approaching the scholarly very difficult scholarly problems that she was focused on, and and um, never more than in this book, uh, <coughs> I, I think, which is the most personal of her books, and 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 um, which which weaves together a lifetime of thought about what. What Christianity me means, what it, what it meant in its earliest stages, what it might have meant if it had gone in a in a different direction uh, from from the canonization process that 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 uh, um, uh, that actually took place, the role of women uh, in in uh, early Christianity is, seems to me as a, as as an outsider to be critical because uh, not only was, was Roman culture uh, a severely patriarchal, a Greco-Roman culture, but uh, uh, at that time the Jewish culture was severely patriarchal and, and, uh, and Elaine has illuminated the way that women uh, opened up the, the, the way people thought about, about God and, and, and worship and practice uh, in, in a way that was, that was automatically more inclusive because it had added half the human race. And, uh, but also the, the idea of focusing your life uh, on the texts that were excluded from the canon and saying, you know, what is, what is here that is worthwhile? <laughs> What was there something here that 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 the people doing the canonizing, uh, who were all men, uh, maybe were a little afraid of uh, the influence of, of mysticism, the influence of of uh, uh, the 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 kind of uh, uh, religious, ex you know, sometimes extreme religious commitments associated with the Essenes and other others. Uh, um, who were peripheral to the to both Judaism and Christianity uh, uh, at that time? I, th I think it's I think that 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 uh, Dr. Pagel ha had a an amazing opportunity at the beginning of her career to to um, give these interpret and give these texts to the world for the first time. And she made great use of that in, in the half a century of, of her work. Okay. Yes. So I have an idea about, an, about closing with an experience. Um, it's been so rich. Thank you. Anybody? Thank you. Yeah. So, 
a little uh, personal word. When Hope and I lived in Pasadena, uh, we had a rabbi in residence at our church. And uh, he would invite us to his home uh, many Friday nights. And the most moving and memorable part of the evening, and again, I remind us that this is Friday night, which means that the Sabbath has begun, was the blessing of the children. And it was in those experiences that were so moving to me that I kept saying to Hope, whenever we retire, we are going to retire to be near our grandchildren so that we can get together at least once a week, it doesn't have to be on Friday night, and bless the children, uh, which is what we've done. Um, I want to invite all of you all and all of us into an imaginative experience that is real of, you may close your eyes if you'd like, to imagine your being at a table of love on Friday night or some night of the holy, and all of the adults there blessing you as a child. And simply let your heart desire the deepest blessing you want to have right now in your life. And then, Mel, if you will, if you'll bless us in Hebrew. And Elaine, if you will bless us from that prayer in your, that closes your book. Would that be okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll do the, um, the priestly blessing, which I do for my children and grandchildren, and and you can do the Shehechayana, which you read about in the, in the last episode of your, of your book uh, yes. in the graduation ceremony at, at Harvard. How, how about that? You, maybe you should tell about that. Um, so the... the uh, well, it's just it's, it's a story about coming through a lot of things and... and um, children that I raised being there and the people that we lost were not there and there was a great deal to celebrate and <clears throat> and what came to me was a, was a Jewish prayer blessed art thou Lord God of the universe <clears throat> that you have brought us alive to see this day that's the prayer that you spoke also with a better translation. <laughs> well, I'll just I'll just say that in Hebrew. How about that? Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of the universe. Shehechayana um, has has kept us in life, Kiyamana, and sustained us, Higiyana Lazman Hazeh, and brought us to this time. Amen. Amen. So. Again, uh, before we leave and applaud some more, uh, books are available for sale. Um, Mel has to go to a family wedding tomorrow, so he won't be here to sign. So we'll impose on him to sign a few books tonight. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, no, I want, it. I want to, to, to talk with more, more of you in the congregation, and I especially would love to hear what Elaine is going to say tomorrow. I strongly recommend that you... Here. We'll make a secret recording for you to watch, <laughs> okay. and we'll ask you to come back. Yeah. And uh, Elaine uh, may choose to some sign some books or wait till, till tomorrow. The coffee and the uh, croissants will be out at what time? Eight or eight? Eight eight thirty. So come, uh, be here, uh, be there, and be square. Um, <laughs> again, it is a holy thing to applaud. Thank you very I'm all, much. I'm also old enough to use words. So. <laughs> we are adjourned.